right. Welcome, everyone. We're going to call this hearing to order. So this is the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. The time is about nine minutes after three o'clock. We are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. A quorum is present. And in accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Herr from, uh, will be um, participating from St. Paul, Minnesota, Senator Port from Burnsville, Minnesota, Senator Lang from Olivia, Minnesota. Uh, so members and to the public, we have uh, five bills on the agenda, effectively four, because two of the bills are gonna be merged together at the outset, my two bills. Um, and we're going to skip over uh, Senator Seeberger's bill, which is the first bill on the agenda because she's stuck in Judiciary Committee right now. So we'll take hers up as soon as she can get here. And um, not on the agenda, uh, we're going to start with the, the new, um, well, new police chief or acting police chief. He's just passed his licensure requirements, will be sworn in in a few days uh, for Metro Transit, um, just to uh, acquaint himself with our committee. And uh, it's also perfect timing because uh, it will help us set a little bit of the context for the bills that I'll be bringing forward, which are on the subject of safety on our public transit system. So welcome to the committee. So pleased uh, to welcome you also to Minnesota. And if you would introduce yourself for the record and um, anything that you'd like to share with us, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Double Committee members. Um, my name is uh, Chief Ernest Morales Starrett. I'm the Chief of Metro Transit Police Department. As the Chair mentioned, I just recently received my license as of Monday of this week, the 13th. Uh, I want to share with you, if I may, my 32 years of law enforcement. 30 of those years were with the NYPD, where I retired as the executive officer of Housing Borough Bronx, Queens. But prior to that, I had the privilege of serving as the commanding officer of Transit Bureau District 12, which encompassed eight of the 12 police precincts within the borough of the Bronx. I was responsible for the supervision of 179 sworn officers and the commute, safety commute of 500,000 passengers on a daily basis. In that role, we came up with strategies on how to reduce crime, and we did this through a variety of exercises and plans that I plan to implement here as well. But we also, and most importantly, did this through relationships built with community members and employees throughout the systems. So this is a philosophy that I definitely want to apply in Metro Transit. As I see, we have a 40-point safety action plan, and it's important that we bring all those pieces together, especially with community members, because in my experience here, I've been riding the lines, the blue lines, the green lines. I've also been on the buses as well. And I see what seems to be problematic and unpleasant to the everyday commuter. My personal experience is that while I felt uncomfortable during my commute, I didn't necessarily feel threatened. However, perception is very important, particularly when you're a commuter experiencing the ride. So with that, I want to start implementing different strategies where I will deploy my people effectively on throughout the system. And I plan on leading from the front and doing that and leading by example. This has already started this week where I went to one of our more challenging stations, Lake Street Hathaway Station, just to experience the issues and see what the issues were firsthand. With that said, I plan on rebuilding the department and our retention and recruitment policies, coming up with long-term solutions on that. As I mentioned, strategically deploying our resources partnering up with other law enforcement agencies. We have a memorandum of, uh, of understandings that we're streamlining to partner up with other agencies so they can help us on the system, as well as hiring supplemental security with private security companies. I believe that this strategy will go a long way in fostering partnerships 
to resolve the long-term solutions that we are experiencing, not only in transit, but I want to remind the committee that we're a small footprint in these communities that are experiencing larger problems. So with effective partnerships, I believe that we can come together and move forward and strategize long-term plans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Morales. Um, are you willing to respond to any questions or hear any, any thoughts from the committee? Absolutely. I didn't warn you that we might do that because I just thought of it. Uh, members, uh, any questions or any thoughts to share with the chief? Well, I'll just say um, we're glad to have you on, on board, no pun intended. Uh, and um, and as, as I've expressed to you uh, when we've met earlier, uh, the, the challenges are, are substantial. Um, and the, the prospects uh, of failure are not, are not uh, available. We have to succeed at uh, turning the culture and the circumstances around on our transit system. It's just far, far too important to too many people um, who need to get to where they need to go. Um, and it's important for, for a whole lot of reasons. And uh, I appreciate that uh, you're coming with a, a fresh perspective and fresh energy and, and, uh, and a lot of experience. So really appreciate that. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Chief Morales. Uh, so one question that I have, uh, we're looking at the possibility of the legalization of recreational marijuana here in Minnesota, which is new. Uh, and we've seen in some studies when that does happen, uh, it can actually get worse on, on the transit and, and may, people may feel, as you mentioned, uncomfortable. How, uh, what's your plan to address that issue if that does happen this year or next year, whenever that may happen? I'm assuming it's, it's something you're familiar with and, and what some of the issues will be with that. So. Thank you. Uh, Chair? Chief Morales. Member, I would say that, yes, it, it's definitely going to be challenging, but however, we have our code of conduct, and we're looking for the support of the code of conduct. Once we have the code of conduct approved, we will enforce the laws as they are written on the uh, system. So we're looking for constant support. And we definitely want to respect the laws as they're implemented, but we also want to make it convenient and comfortable for our daily commuters. Senator Jason. Thank you. All right. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add my welcome to Minnesota. We're grateful to you for coming here and taking on this challenge. Um, and want to thank you for your service in advance. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Anything further, members? All right, appreciate your being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Senator Dilbill, wait, welcome to the testifier's table. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, members, I have um, in front of us uh, two Senate files, Senate file 2506 and Senate file 1049, um, both of which deal with the subject that, that we're discussing right now, um, public safety on our transit systems. And um, I thought uh, in the interests of um, efficiency, um, uh, and uh, time management. Uh, my intention, uh, Madam Chair, is to um, basically, um, with some variations, um, merge the two bills together uh, under the cover of uh, Senate File 1049, so merge uh, many of the elements of Senate File 2506 uh, into the uh, original, what we would call the agency bill, uh, Senate file 1049 is the agency bill that we commonly know as administrative citations, uh, even though it has a lot of other aspects to it. Senate file 2506 um, develops uh, um, some other concepts around um, what we used to call the ambassador program, as well as uh, an opportunity to uh, really focus some, some time and attention for a period of time to hopefully reset um, the culture and the behavior and you know the experience of the riders on our transit system. So um, 
with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment to the uh, 10, Senate file 1049 and put that in front of the committee. Okay, members, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, the amendment passes. So, uh, Mr. Greenfield is prepared to walk us through um, the now merged versions of the of the bill. I'm trying to find my. Oh, here it is. He wrote me some notes, um, so I'll follow along while he while he reads along um, and uh, helps explain all the elements of the now combined 2506 and 1049. Um, and then my intention will be just to add some context setting comments and then we have a number of testifiers and then I'll respond to questions, other amendments and conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Mr. Greenfield is next. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Uh, I just wanna run down the A1 um, delete everything amendment and identify the provisions um, that may be pulled from Senate file 1049, Senate file 2506 or uh, is not in either piece, uh, uh, in either Senate file. So beginning on section one uh, for the A1 amendment, uh, which begins on page one, line three, this authorizes uh, transit rider investment program personnel that are established later on in the bill to administer uh, opiate antagonists um, for drug overdose. Um, the transit rider investment program personnel are uh, still have to follow the same requirements um, in terms of entering a protocol with a right licensed medical professional and having the appropriate training to administer the antagonist. Uh, this section is not in either Senate file 1049 or the 2506 as introduced. And Madam Chair, that's otherwise known as Narcan. Section two, which begins on page one, line 26, is a provision that's not in either Senate file um, but it imposes a $25 surcharge for a conviction uh, of an offense under 609855 subdivisions 1, 3, and 3A. Uh, I'll note at the outset um, on page 2, line 2, that the, the section reference 609855 is the list of prohibited activities on a transit vehicle, um, which will become relevant when we talk about how those provisions change later on. Section three begins on page three, line one. This provides for the disbursement of the surcharges that are collected as a result of the conversion and, and modification of certain uh, prohibited activities. Um, it deposits the surcharges into the uh, general fund on page three, lines 12 to 15 in paragraph C. The section is effective July 1, 2023. Section four is the first section that incorporates language from 2506 and 1049 together, so I'm gonna walk through it on a subdivision by subdivision level. Section one, or subdivision one, excuse me, on page three, line 26, establishes a rider code of conduct, and uh, paragraph B on page three, line 29, uh, specifies that the code of conduct must not prohibit sleeping in a manner that doesn't, does not otherwise violate conduct requirements. This language is adopted from 2506. Subdivision two begins on page three, line 31, and wraps around to page four. This provides some definitions, including um, a definition of a peace officer and transit official. Uh, this adopts the language that, uh, from S Senate file 2506 and paragraph B, which is on lines 4.4 to 4.7, that a peace officer may order a person to depart a transit vehicle or transit facility for a violation of the code of conduct if the person continues to act in violation of the code of conduct after being warned once by a transit official. So only the peace officer may remove the person for um, a continued violation after a warning. Um, and that continued violation after a warning requirement or decision to uh, remove a person uh, is picked up in other places. So when I refer to uh, continued, act, continued violation after a warning, that's what I'm referring to. Um, like I said, this subdivision two is adopted from Senate file 2506. Subdivision three and four are pulled in from Senate file 1049. 
Subdivision three on page four, line eight, establishes paid fair zones, requiring the Metropolitan Council to establish and clearly designate paid fair zones at each light rail transit station where the council utilizes self-service barrier-free fare collection. Subdivision four is also from 1049. This provides for light rail transit facility monitoring, uh, requiring Met Council to implement public safety monitoring and response activities at light rail transit facilities, including the placement of security cameras and sufficient associated lighting that will cover the entire light rail transit station and each light rail transit vehicle. It installs a public address system at each light rail transit station that is capable of providing information and warnings. Real-time active monitoring of passenger activity and potential violations throughout the light rail transit station, uh, transit system, excuse me. And paragraph B on page four, line 20, um, requires the council um, to have timely maintenance and replacing of malfunctioning cameras or public address systems as part of the overall requirement for monitoring activities. This section, um, section four, is effective the day filing fo following final enactment. Section five on page four, line 25, creates what is known as the Transit Rider Investment Program, or TRIP. While Senate file 1049 has a transit enforcement and administrative penalties provision that is roughly similar to the language in 10, the, the, the delete everything, neither Senate file 2506 or Senate file 1049 specifically uses the language um, known as uh, TRIP or uh, adopts the, the model uh, under a different name. So um, section, Senate file 2506 doesn't even have an equivalent for the transit rider investment program. Um, so it's not pulled in from any particular section but was adopted um, by the House, um, House file th uh, 1322. And, uh, and Madam Chair, this is where um, in earlier iterations and conversations and bills we talked about something called the ambassador program, so this would approximate that. Thank you, Senator Devil. Mr. Would you Greenfield. like me to go through each yes. provision, Senator Dibble? Mr. Um, Greenfield, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. I think this is important enough that I think people are interested in the details. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair and, Mr. and Senator Dibble, um, I, so in, included in the Transit Rider Investment Program, I'll go subdivision by subdivision. Subdivision one defines terms, uh, including um, defining trip personnel, um, which uh, author is which are authorized by the Metropolitan Council for the TRIP program to uh, perform acts such as fare inspection and enforcement, um, and they are specifically not peace officers or community service officers. Uh, Subdivision 2 establishes the TRIP program uh, and obligates the Metropolitan Council to uh, create the program um, and provide uh, specific requirements uh, as part of um, implementing uh, the TRIP program, and these requirements are on page 5, lines 10, to 26. Subdivision three begins on page five, line 27, uh, requiring the Metropolitan Council to appoint a trip manager to manage the trip program. Uh, the manager must have managerial experience in social services, transit service, or law enforcement, and the trip manager is a personnel staff member. Subdivision four, beginning on page five, line 30, and wrapping around to page six, specifies the duties requirements for trip personnel. Such duties include, beginning on page six, monitoring and responding to passenger activity, including educating passengers and specifying expectations relating to the code of conduct, assisting passengers in obtaining social services through information and referrals, acting as a liaison to social service agencies, providing information to passengers on using the transit system, providing direct navigation assistance and accompaniment to passengers who have a disability, are elderly, or request enhanced personal aid, performing fair payment inspections, issuing administrative citations, and obtaining assistance from peace officers or community service officers as necessary. Paragraph B of subdivision four requires a trip personnel to be an employee of Metropolitan Council and must wear a uniform as established by the council at all times when on duty. Subdivision five provides training requirements for trip personnel uh, on a variety of different topics, including early warning techniques, crisis intervention, conflict de-escalation, and conflict resolution, identification of persons likely in need of social services, locally available social service providers, including services for homelessness, mental health, and addiction, policies and procedures for administrative citations, 
and the administration of opiate antagonists, Narcan, in a manner that meets the requirements specified in section one. Um, subdivision six begins on page six, line 25. This creates the administrative citation authority for the Metropolitan Council. Uh, a transit official has the exclusive authority to issue an administrative citation, so this would include trip personnel to a person who commits a violation under 609-855 subdivisions one, three, or three A, which again is the criminal statute uh, specifically addressing prohibited conduct and activities on a transit vehicle or transit platform. Paragraph B for subdivision six begins on page six, line 28, and that uh, provides that the citation uh, must inform the person that there is a right to contest the citation, the basic procedures for contesting the citation, and information on the timeline and consequences of failure to paying uh, or contesting the citation once it's been issued. Page seven um, carries forward uh, subdivision six, uh, paragraph C beginning on page seven, line one, uh, prohibits any quotas for the issuance of administrative citations. Paragraph D um, provides that if a administrative citation is issued, uh, that bars prosecution for any offense arising under section 609-855 subdivision one, three, or three A, and vice versa. So if a person is convicted of a violation of that section, they are not issued an administrative citation. Subdivision seven begins on page seven, line six. This provides for the disposition of an administrative citation. Um, a person who commits the, the violation under 609-855 and has issued a citation must pay the fine within 90 days of issuance. Um, a person who fails to pay is, cons is considered to have waived any right to contest it. Uh, page seven, line 11 provides a civil process to contest the administrative citation before a neutral third party. And paragraph C in subdivision seven, beginning on page seven, line 15, provides that the Metropolitan Council may contract with credit bureaus or other collection agencies um, to determine collection costs and recover those collection costs uh, in addition to the fee um, provided by the administrative citation. Uh, of note, on page seven, line 21, after the period, um, it does provide that if a collection entity collects an amount less than the total due from a violator, the payment is applied proportionally to collection costs and the underlying debt. Subdivision eight provides for uh, the penalties for administrative citations. Paragraph A beginning on seven, page seven, line 24, puts the range for the administrative citation between no less than $35 and no more than $100. Subdivision, or paragraph B of subdivision eight require, uh, allows the Met Council to adopt uh, a graduated structure that increases the fine amount for a second or third violation, uh, uh, second and subsequent violations, not second or third, second and subsequent violations. Paragraph C, beginning on page seven, line 28, provides for an alternative resolution procedure if the person has been issued a citation for the first time under 609-855 subdivisions one, three, or three A. Uh, and must only be available, uh, it is also available for a person who demonstrates financial hardship under criteria established by Metropolitan Council. Section five is effective July 1, 2023. Section six, beginning on page eight, line four, uh, creates a legislative report. Um, at subdivision one defines terms. Subdivision two on page eight, line eight, uh, establishes the report requirements. Um, paragraph B there specifies what the report must detail. Uh, I won't go through each of them, but uh, the reporting requirements go from page eight, line 11, all the way to page nine, lines, uh, line 21. Section seven uh, is amending 609-855. This is on page nine, line 24. This provides that a person who um, conducts certain forms of fare evasion activities, such as failing to provide proof of payment, um, Provide, presenting a falsified, counterfeit, photocopied, or manipulated fare payment. Um, basically, certain kinds of fare evasion activities are considered petty misdemeanors. Uh, and, and paragraph C on page 10, line 16, uh, play, puts the base fee for such a petty misdemeanor at $10. Section eight on page uh, Section 8 on page 10, line 19, um, specifies that certain prohibited activities are a petty misdemeanor. 
Um, so this is kind of a convoluted section in the sense that it strikes certain activities that were considered misdemeanors and carries them um, to varying degrees later. Um, so to recap, uh, in sec section 609855 subdivision three, section eight of the bill, um, certain things are no longer misdemeanors, including uh, watching or listening to a TV um, at a loud volume, um, consuming food or beverages, or carrying an animal without authorization. However, it keeps the penalty for, uh, keeps the prohibition on littering, uh, provided that a person has been warned and continues to litter. This makes the littering charge under 609855 a petty misdemeanor. And now I'll note that the final stricken activity that is, uh, stri final stricken prohibited activity in, uh, under old current law is smoking, but that is picked up in a later section. Um, so if that all makes sense, um, I, I'm happy to walk through. Um, but this provision is not in either Senate File 1049 or Senate File 2506. Section nine uh, creates a new misdemeanor uh, prohibited act, uh, new prohibited activities that uh, carry the charge of a misdemeanor. This is the new subdivision 3A of which I was referring to earlier. Um, so certain activities are considered um, a misdemeanor if a person performs them while in a transit vehicle or at a transit facility. Um, this is again the prohibition on smoking as I just referenced, uh, urinating or defecating, consuming an alcoholic beverage, um, damaging a transit vehicle or transit facility that would meet analogous requirements for fourth degree criminal damage to property, um, which includes vandalism, defacement, and placement of graffiti, uh, engages in disorderly conduct, and uh, in paragraph B there on page 11, line 19, a peace officer may order a person to depart a transit vehicle or transit facility f if a person uh, engages in the prohibited activity specified in paragraph A. Section 10 begins on page 11, line 23. Uh, this is just a def definition conforming change. Uh, the change is not made until page 12, line 12 in paragraph G. This just uh, adds a transit official um, as defined in the TRIP section of law um, as a transit provider uh, or a transit representative, excuse me, um, which essentially authorizes a trip personnel to issue the administrative citation, provide the initial warning um, that a peace officer can then follow up on when removing a person for a violation of the code of conduct or the prohibited activities in um, 609-855 subdivision 6A, or 3A, excuse me. Page 12, line 17, uh, establishes the Transit Service Intervention Project. And again, much like the Transit Rider Improvement, uh, in, in, uh, the TRIP program established in Section 5, um, Section 11 has a variety of different subdivisions, so I'm gonna break them down subdivision by subdivision. Um, beginning on page 12, line 18, uh, that defines terms. Subdivision two establishes the Transit uh, Service Intervention Project. Uh, the intention of that uh, establishment is to provide coordinated high visibility interventions on light rail transit lines that provide for enhanced social services outreach and engagement, code of conduct regulation, and law enforcement. Subdivision three begins on page 12, line 27. Uh, this requires the transit rider investment program manager that was established in section five to m implement the intervention project established under this section, section 11. Subdivision four, beginning on 12, page 12, line 30, uh, requires the trip manager to seek the participation of the following entities to provide for coordination on the intervention project, including the Department of Human Services, the Department of Public Safety, the Metropolitan Council, each county in which a light rail transit line operates, each city in which a light rail transit line operates, the National Alliance on Mental Illness Minnesota, the exclusive representative of transit vehicle operators and other inter interested community-based social services organizations. Subdivision five on page 13, line eight, establishes the duties of the trip manager in instituting the intervention program. I won't go through the entire list of um, requirements and duties, uh, but the trip manager uh, essentially has to establish intervention teams and then establish coordinated intervention teams. The Social services intervention teams are just social services personnel, whereas the coordination intervention teams, as described on page 13, line 17 and 18, includes both 
social services intervention teams, community service officers, and peace officers. And again, of note in subdivision five, there is a two-phase implementation of the intervention program. Um, the first three weeks of the intervention program deploy just the social services intervention team on a mobile basis on light rail transit lines and facilities. That's on page 13, line 20. And then the second phase of the intervention um, begins nine, uh, after the culmination of the first phase and goes for nine weeks. That begins on page 13, lines 22 to 24. Moving ahead to subdivision six of section 11, that begins on page 14, line one. This requires the Metropolitan Council to institute the intervention program with existing resources and administrative support. Subdivision seven on page 14, line three, creates a reporting requirement where the trip manager must submit a status report to the chairs and ranking minority members of the House and Senate Transportation Committees, which summarizes the activities under the intervention project provides a fiscal review of expenditures, and provides an analysis on, of impacts and outcomes related to the outreach uh, uh, violations of the uh, rider code of conduct and uh, uh, prohibited activities and rider experience. Subdivision eight on page 14, line 10, expires the intervention program on June 30th, 2024. Section 11 is effective the day following final enactment. Page 14, line 14 is uh, the first appropriation section. This appropriates money in fiscal years 23, 24, and 25 of an unspecified sum um, for the tri transit rider investment program or TRIP and for the legislative report required um, as part of the TRIP uh, st statute being, uh, being proposed. Uh, this money is added to the base for this activity. Paragraph B under section 12, um, first, uh, from the appropriation that is given in paragraph A, uh, requires the Metropolitan Council to first implement TRIP within six months of the date of enactment of this section and deploy TRIP personnel to the light rail transit system um, within that, uh, from that appropriation. And section 12 is effective the day following final enactment. And finally, section 13 is an appropriation from the general fund uh, for grants to participating organizations for the transit service intervention project specified under section 11. Uh, so again, this is separate from TRIP, but this is the service intervention project that was discussed in section 11. It is a one-time appropriation and is available until June 30th, 2024. And then the final page is a title change which concerns no one but Senate engrossing. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Greenfield, if you just want to describe the two items that were not picked up, one out of Senate file 1049 and one out of Senate file 2506, just because I don't want, uh, don't want anyone to accuse me of hiding the ball. There are just a couple things that, everything for the most part from both bills, plus new elements of course are in the DE, but two items um, didn't carry over. Mm -hmm. so. Mr. Greenfield. Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, thank you. Um, Sorry, Madam Chair. Section two of the Senate file 1049 as introduced is not in the A1. This was the requirement uh, that obligated Met Council to not reduce the staff complement of transit police below the average staffing level for the most three recent years. Um, what also is not included in the delete everything amendment that is in currently the as introduced version of Senate file 2506 is maintaining the misdemeanor penalty for certain prohibited conduct in 609-855 and also removes the warning continued behavior requirement before a peace officer can order a person to depart. So as I broke down in 609-855 and in the Rider Code of Conduct in section four, um, 2506 removes the warning continued conduct before a peace officer may order someone to depart a transit vehicle. Um, so I think that that covers the, the gist of the bill. Um, what I would say, because I didn't say it at the outset in my final remarks, is that Section 11, the Transit Service, Transit Service Intervention Project, is mostly pulled from Senate File 2506. Um, there are some subtle differences um, and some larger differences, such as the, the requirement that the trip manager administer the Transit Service Intervention Program, um, but the substance of the Transit Service Intervention Program is more or less the same as it is in the Azure Introduced Version of 2506. And with that, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Greenfield. Senator Dibble, do you want to go on to testifiers or do you want to have committee discussion now? Um, Madam Chair, why don't we hear from the testifiers? Um, I was going to give some background uh, comments, but I think the testifiers will probably um, 
handle that uh, uh, and make the make the case uh, fairly compelling, um, and then I'll come back um, just to uh, make a, just a couple comments and then respond to questions. And I know there's at least one amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very good, Senator Devil. So on my list here, I have um, Ava Johnson and Aiden Kilgannon. Forgive me if I've mispronounced your names. Please come to the testifier's table. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Aiden Kilgannon. I'm 28 years old. Can I ask you to bring the microphone kind of closer to your mouth? Yeah, you, you have to kind of lean into it. Thank you. Aiden Kilgannon, and I'm 28 years old. And thank you for inviting us. I'm Eva Johnson, and I'm his mother. Um, and I'm going to do this with just asking Aiden some questions so that he has the opportunity to share his story. Um, Aiden, where do you work? Neighborhood Cafe. And where is that? St. Paul. And how do you, or how did you get to work at the Neighborhood Cafe from Apple Valley? I take the red line to the mall, get on the blue line, that would bring me down to 46th stop, then I get on the A line. And how long have you worked at the Neighborhood Cafe? About five months. Years. 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 Five to six years. Yep, and before that, you worked at the Water Park of America. And so Aiden has been taking public transportation since he was 20 years old. Um, regular route public transportation. Um, and I want Aiden to share his story from February 3rd now, 2023. What happened, Aiden? So this woman wore a gray towel, nothing underneath. She went behind me with a shoe, flinged my hat off, took my gray bag, came back, whacked me with a shoe, and spit in my face twice. And Aiden, did you say anything to this person before she started to assault you? No. So were there other people in the car on the light rail when, when you were being assaulted? Yes, and they did not help me. So I would argue that the light rail actually is dangerous, that it isn't just uncomfortable. Aiden, my amazing adult son with Down syndrome, can no longer ride on the light rail because it is not safe. Aiden, do you want to ride on the light rail to get to work and the bus? Oh, I like to. What needs to happen before you can do that? It needs to be way safer. It needs to be safe. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for hearing what we had to share. Um, I am very hopeful that my son will be allowed once again to have a safe ride to work because Lyft is very expensive. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your testimony. Aiden, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Thanks. And Madam Chair, uh, Senator uh, I also want to say thank you for coming um, you. and sharing your story. And it was very brave and uh, very meaningful. And we're all, well, I'm also very sorry for what you've experienced. We're going to try to make it better. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, I have Brooke Blakely. Welcome to the testifier's table. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Morrison and committee members. My name is Brooke Blakey. I am the Director of the Office of Neighborhood Safety for the City of St. Paul. In my previous role, I served as a Captain and Sergeant of the Transit, Metro Transit's Homeless Action Team, as well as just a Street Officer for Metro Transit, and I'm here, to, here today to testify in support of the aforementioned bills. Um, the City of St. Paul is supportive of these bills for a variety of reasons. This would benefit the riders of St. Paul by providing an innovative approach to public safety that focuses on engaging directly with our community, looking at how the policies, procedures, and operations can be more progressive, equitable, and answer to the needs of our community better, and serving all of our system riders equally. The addition of the proposed transit service intervention project aligns with the Community First Public Safety Framework by providing consistent and equitable partnership within the planning processes and services proposed to be offered to the community. 
This also allows direct engagement with the Metro Transit Police Department, community-based organizations, and advocacy groups that will contribute and provide guidance to the agency's interaction with community, which is, in, which is essential to building a sense of trust and ownership in our ridership. Establishment of the Transit Rider Investment Program aligns with the Office of Neighborhood Safety's Community Response Teams, which are coast, heart, and cares that address, the, that address those experiencing homelessness, mental health crisis, substance abuse, and provides wraparound services that would have seamless interaction with the TRIP program. The establishment of the transit intervention, transit service intervention project will reduce fare evasions, increase revenue, and create more positive interactions with the riders. In regards to the Senate Bill 2049, I think it's important that we also talk about the administrative citation and how we are proposing decriminalizing behaviors for our most vulnerable residents while also in the same protecting our most vulnerable residents. And it is in alignment with our community first public safety framework, which emphasizes needing to work together to make sure that all the members of our community find long lasting solutions to crime that don't lead to repeated criminal criminality or cycles of abuse. Administration citations are an efficient and cost-effective alternative to harsher penalties that would allow transit to inter issue citations to fare evaders quickly and save time and money and both, but also provide the appropriate enforcement and response to those that are fare evading as well as offenders and victims the same. We know that criminal prosecution can be harsh and costly, and it can have a disproportionate impact on our low-income individuals as well as communities of color. Administrative citations, on the other hand, is a more proportionate response to the offense and allows for greater discretion in who we are enforcing those upon. One of the major facets of our community-first public safety framework is following data to positively impact safety outcomes. As we've heard over and over again, safety is a main priority for everyone. Administrative citations also allow for the ability to collect data on the fair evasion, such as the frequency, demographics of the offenders, as well as victims, and that will help inform the strategies to reduce, reduce fair evasion and improve services. Overall, administrative citations is practical and an effective way of enforcing that while, while minimizing the effects and burden of officers and community. Thank you for your, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Blakey. Uh, next up, I have Will Sharir. I know you're gonna correct that pronunciation, I apologize. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and uh, members of the, uh, of the uh, uh, committee. Uh, my name is Will Schroer, and you did very well. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm the executive director of East Metro Strong, and uh, in conversation with staff, they thought it would be useful if I would uh, share a couple of slides. So if you'll uh, bear with me for one second, this shouldn't take more than 10 seconds to, to get going. And then share. Excellent. Uh, uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, spend a couple of minutes with you today. Uh, in addition to the perspectives you've heard, I'd like to uh, bring an additional perspective. Uh, and if I can take 10 seconds to go back just a, a couple of years. When this idea was, was first uh, uh, being uh, discussed and debated um, uh, at this committee, among others, uh, the, the board of East Metro Strong asked me if I knew of experience with similar programs in other regions and asked uh, I and one of our consultants to, um, to do a little review of experiences in other areas. And uh, so I wanna share that review with you and then finish with a little update uh, out of the um, out of the pandemic. So um, all the way back in 2012, this is not a new question, and uh, the Transportation Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences uh, did a review and uh, endorsed the, the approach that's in front of you today of, of using a, a customer-oriented enforcement uh, um, rather than police, uh, use a, a, a civil citations approach, and, uh, and uh, do that fair inspection with non-sworn officers, all of which is part of the uh, approach that's in front of you today. So uh, a national best practice um, uh, endorsed by uh, this research organization. That was in 2012. 
Uh, we then uh, were, were commissioned to do this research uh, in 2020, and uh, uh, the approach was, was pretty straightforward. We talked to the chiefs of police of transit systems around the country that had implemented a similar approach, and uh, we collected that into uh, a research report, which I'd be happy to, to share with you. Uh, the community administrator has a two-page summary of that report if you're interested, and we presented it at the TRB annual meeting uh, in a peer reviewed uh, environment. So I um, like to think that the, the research was, uh, was sound. Uh, and the long and the short of it is that uh, since 2012, following the recommendations of the, of the National Academy, uh, a lot of different uh, regions implemented uh, the approach that is uh, under consideration today. Um, all of these uh, uh, transit agencies deploy staff other than police officers, and many of them use those in the way that are being uh, discussed with you today. Um, and I would underline uh, that all of these units work closely with police. These, uh, these yeah, programs no, no, no. are not set up in competition with the police, but Ooh, rather in support. We don't even have any tunes going today. I don't know if that's, I sure hope that's not me. All right. Um, the, the responses that we heard from the transit chiefs of police were, were to me, a little bit surprising since public policy experiences can vary, but they were all unanimously uh, consistent that adding non-police staff really lets uh, police focus on policing and that adding those staff reduce the calls to police for non-police purposes and they increase calls to police for police purposes. So it's a sort of a win-win uh, situation. Let me then finish with, uh, with uh, experiences coming out of COVID uh, and I'm just gonna cite two of the organizations uh, that have uh, pointed to, to this approach as being useful during COVID. Um, uh, the BART police chief uh, points to having non-sworn staff uh, out, making people feel comfortable as people come back uh, from reduced ridership during COVID and uh, is very explicit about that. LA Metro uh, conducted a pilot during COVID and was so pleased with that pilot that they have expanded their, um, uh, they call them ambassadors, uh, to a, a size of 300, uh, really an un uh, a remarkable expansion based on uh, the success of their program uh, in achieving their goals. So that is a very quick trip through uh, some national experience. Uh, it, uh, the, the matter in front of you today uh, picks up a lot of those national um, lessons and uh, we're pleased to support the suggestions in front of you today. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Schroer. Next up, I believe we are remote. I think we have Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Lundy. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please state your name I, I for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I didn't want to start talking and no one could hear anything. Uh, my name is Jeff Lundy, uh, Hennepin County Commissioner for District 1, also chair of the Public Safety Committee for the county. Um, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Hennepin County plays a significant role funding the region's public transit system, specifically the capital funding and operating costs for our light rail and bus rapid transit lines to serve Minnesotans with convenient, equitable access to jobs, schools, and their daily needs. The county has a deep interest in the current and future success of our transit system, which is integral to the success of our region and state. Safety is a key component in the delivery of quality transit systems. Incidents of harassment, crime on the transit system compromise riders' sense of safety and actually discourage people from using transit, which can lead to decreased ridership and even, even greater sense of risk. We understand the scope of the issue extends far beyond. The transit system requires holistic solutions and greater investment in economic opportunity, housing, mental health services, and homelessness response. Our region needs a safer, efficient, and reliable transit system to better serve riders and meet the full economic benefit, climate, and congestion fighting potential of public transit. We support the bill's goal to shift the culture, improve safety on the system, and we thank Senator Dibble for his work, for taking our considerations and making this an effective solution. Alternative public safety interventions, including social service personnel and transit ambassadors can provide additional security and help reduce transit riders' fears. Hennepin County is best suited in this project to provide technical assistance and support. Uh, and a personal note, uh, prior to becoming County Commissioner, I was mayor of Brooklyn Park for 10 years. Brooklyn Park was the pilot for the Embedded Social Worker Program with Hennepin County 
where we took social workers, embedded them inside our police departments to handle what we consider non-law enforcement scenarios where we really need to respond with social workers, not uh, law enforcement or police. Uh, during that experience, we actually saw calls from certain types of uh, indicators decrease by over 80%. Last December, to also share with the committee, um, the county has continued to expand our embedded social worker program, including a partnership with the city of Minneapolis to add six embedded social workers and expanding our social worker program into our 911 system and also six more across our uh, suburban agencies. Um, we continue to add this feature and use that uh, to help deliver services uh, in different ways in partnership with our uh, law enforcement partners. And also just to uh, share with you, the costs for that are actually shared between the county and the cities. So I always think if people are willing to fund things, they really believe in things. And so our partner cities, suburbs and urban, all believe in this program that they've invested their own money along with ours to deliver those solutions. We support the Metro Transit contracting with community-based organizations to provide the service. These organizations can hire quickly, work across the Metro, and already connected with the county health and homeless systems. They work alongside Metro Transit Police to help transit transition the organization to a long-term solution. They will provide an efficient solution to get this project up and running in the expedited time frame. Again, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you and the community members for prioritizing this work this session and the opportunity to remotely testify. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Next up, also remote, I have Jonah Rothstein. Jonah, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, Senators. My name is Jonah Rothstein. I'm a community member in South Minneapolis. Um, I was a daily transit rider from 2006 to 2013 on bus lines, and I'm an occasional rider now on the blue and green lines. So I know quite confidently what the system should look like at its best, and I can say again with confidence that um, in the entire lifespan of the light rail, this is definitely the worst that the system has ever been in the 19 years since it's been operating. Um, I feel like this is a five alarm fire and we're not talking about it like it's an emergency. I'm glad to hear Senator Double say that failure is not an option. I'm glad to hear that Chief Morales is riding um, the train himself. I, I think it's very important that our leaders are, are on the system and seeing what, what I'm seeing and seeing what other people are seeing. Um, the reality at Lake and Hiawatha is people loitering and blocking access, people using fentanyl and opioids, on the platform and the train, broken and boarded up, uh, windows, doors, elevators and escalators not working, violent assaults of people, including um, a member of the transgender community. It's, it's just completely unacceptable. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a regard or the staffing, surely, for enforcing the existing nuisance laws on the books. I submit that we need a 24-7, 365 police presence at this station until the situation can be resolved. I support the bill. I support the transit ambassador program. But a three-month pilot doesn't really seem to me and to others I talk to in the proximate community like something that is going to create systemic culture change in our system. Uh, I'll just add that my partner takes the blue line to and from downtown six days a week. So I do hear from him a lot about his experience. And I often end up picking him up from downtown so that he doesn't have to ride and deal with the discomfort and the hostility of, of the train. Um, I also heard from Commissioner Lundy uh, at the House um, version of this meeting, as well as uh, one of the commissioners, I think Commissioner Moran from Ramsey County, that they simply don't have the resources in terms of social workers to do what this bill is asking the counties to do. So I'm concerned that the bill is over-reliant upon county social work resources that simply don't exist and are simply at capacity already. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, 
for, for allowing me to testify finally all today um, that I support um, Senator Dibble's uh, bill to make the Met Council an elected body because I think they've abdicated their responsibility towards um, creating a safe community in the metro. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Rustin. Next, I have Bentley Graves. There you are. Please come to the testifier's table. Welcome. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Bentley Graves with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Minnesota businesses depend upon a safe, reliable, efficient, and multimodal transportation system to get their goods to market and their employees, customers, and input materials to their door. For many employers in the metro area, the metro transit system continues to be an important means of drawing employees from across the region to their sites. And for some employees, as we heard earlier, public transit is the only means of transportation available to get to and from work. In recent years, however, safety concerns within the metro transit system have increased significantly. Just weeks ago, the Met Council released new data indicating that crime on the metro transit system has increased by 54% in 2022, with narcotics and weapons complaints increasing 182 and 145% respectively, and liquor law violations increasing 92%. We support Senate File 1049 as amended uh, as an important step in addressing the safety issues that exist within the transit system, with a particular focus on the light rail system. We're hopeful that the bill's establishment of a new transit service intervention project on the light rail system over the coming months will begin to address the many social service challenges that often underpin and sometimes fuel the kinds of behaviors and situations that pose a safety risk to others. It's our hope that this near-term action over the coming months will lay the groundwork for the longer-term solutions in the bill through the Transit Rider Investment Program and increased focus on fair and code of conduct enforcement. The state and region have made significant investments and continue to make significant investments in the metro transit system, both in terms of maintaining and operating it, as well as continuing to build it out. However, if people don't feel safe using public transit, they won't use it. If safety concerns keep riders away, public transit cannot be the complementary component of our transportation infrastructure that we all need it to be. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide this input today, and we appreciate the leadership of Senator Dibble and this committee on this important issue, and we encourage your support of Senate File 1049. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Graves. Uh, Senator Dibble. And, and Madam Chair, if we could uh, call Judge Shetnan, um, I meant to add him to the testifiers list. Senate file 1049 is the agency bill, um, and, uh, and so he will testify to um, some of the elements in that bill and the overall theme. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Judd Shatnan, and I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Metropolitan Council. And uh, before I start my testimony, I would like to uh, also express to, uh, to Aiden uh, that we at Met Council and Metro Transit are... Uh, appalled to hear of the behavior that he had to experience on the train, and we are very sorry for that. Our intent is to make everybody feel safe and secure on our trains and at our facilities, and, uh, and so it's really hard to hear, to be honest with you, and, uh, and so we are looking to improve that. And um, I'd like to thank Senator Dibble. Uh, this is, I believe, the fifth year in a row you've carried the administrative citations bill for us. We have brought this bill forward for many, many years to, to help address some of these issues. Uh, we talked earlier this year, you made a comment, Senator Dibble, that it's going to pass this year, and we are very happy to hear that. Uh, we've got great support in the other body as well, so that is, uh, that is, is fantastic. And, uh, and we, uh, this House file, or excuse me, Senate file 1049 is the agency bill. Uh, the underlying bill here, we do uh, support the uh, the amendment and all that comes with it. Um, we are leaning into transit safety. Uh, we, our council is meeting on that as we speak today. Uh, we are looking forward to working with community groups uh, to make sure that we can uh, improve the um, the experience of the train. I think that uh, Jonah's comments as well were very well taken. And uh, we have to get a, a handle on, uh, on where things are at. And, and I know the chair, when he was here, mentioned that as well, that that is a priority for us as well. So this is not falling on deaf ears. Uh, we, we have been trying to lean into this. One of the major struggles that we have 
is uh, is is in our workforce and uh, not to go down that line again, but we are struggling to hire police officers and we're struggling to hire um, uh, ambassadors or transit representatives, however you want to speak to them. But I do appreciate the, uh, the amendment and the work that um, Senator Dibble is bringing forward that talks about some of the social service activities. Uh, what we are seeing on, on the transit system isn't a symptom of transit, it is what's going on in our society and people are seeing it on our trains. And so having a broader discussion with uh, our partners across government who have experience in social, social services and have experience in how we manage um, uh, the situation that we're in, I think can only benefit how we um, how, how we fix this and improve the uh, the transit experience because we want Aiden riding um, as soon as he can. We want to make sure that that all of our riders feel safe and secure. And uh, and with that, I'm just going to stop. We've, I've spent a lot of time. I know Chair Zelli spent a lot of time talking about transit safety and security, but uh, but we're very supportive and and really appreciate the um, the work of this committee and particularly Senator Dibble and uh, his willingness to help us year after year after year and hopefully we can get this uh, this passed this year. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on this bill? I'm Beth Blitt. Please come to the testifier's table. Should I come here? Is this the... That's fine. Okay. Please state your name for the oh, record. Oh, certainly. Yeah, and my name is Beth Blick, and I, you know, uh, praise this bill to the sky because I uh, have had problems with people smoking on the train, and also when I'm waiting for the train, I've had to play hardball with a number of people and tell them that, you know, I you know, don't appreciate their smoking, and many times they'll make fun of me and uh, not listen to me. And uh, one guy even said, you know, will you pay, you know, a number of bucks, you know, to shut her up? And nobody says anything. You know, nobody cares. And I'm really so sick of it. And you know, when you know, when I called a police officer about it, he just said, Well, you can call, you know, you know, this number if that ever happens again and so forth and on. And I'm getting so tired of the hypocrisy of a number mention you know, of of the loudspeaker saying no smoking on board, you know, when you know that they're not gonna do anything about it at all whatsoever. That is a problem. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You're welcome. Senator Dibble, do you have any comments before we open it up for member discussion? Um, Madam Chair, I'll just say that uh, the, the stories uh, of the riders themselves are the most compelling. Um, I can say from my own experience, I ride the, the train and the bus. Um, I try to do it as frequently as I possibly can over here to the Capitol. I managed to do it uh, once a week, once every other week. It's not that often. Not very good for a transit activist, but <laughs> I do what I can. Um, and uh, and, uh, and Judd can tell you, um, every time I encounter trouble or something that's problematic, I text him and send him pictures. So I send him a lot of texts and a lot of pictures of litter and talk about uh, smoky trains and uh, threatening behavior. Um, being an out LGBTQ person, um, uh, sometimes I'm, uh, they figure out I'm gay and start uh, pronouncing, uh, you know, threatening uh, gestures and, and comments, not necessarily at me, although that has happened to me before, but that's been many, many years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, I felt uh, very, very insecure and very threatened as an out person moving in the public space. Uh, when people figure out I'm gay and riding the train and act in, in very threatening ways. Um, I can tell you that uh, my uh, counterpart uh, in the House, Representative Hornstein, uh, who doesn't drive, um, has taken to um, using Lyft or calling me up. We actually live about 30 seconds away from each other, so when I drive over, I often go to get him because um, 
because of the, the circumstance and the climate and the environment on the train. Um, so that's all about being uncomfortable on the train, um, but the situation for other people is far worse. Rising to levels of violence uh, of the worst sort. The uh, trains are filthy, they're smoky, the stations are filthy um, and, and unkempt. And in fact, the transit station uh, just a few blocks from where I live, where I typically catch the bus, the Uptown Transit Hub, which has about six or seven lines that converge on it, has an indoor waiting area, which is being closed uh, because the situation has become so intolerable. The Central Station in downtown St. Paul has been closed um, uh, because the situation has become so intolerable. We heard the description of Lake and Hiawatha. Anyways, you get my point. So this is um, a package uh, of, of initiatives uh, and approaches. Um, one of the ideas is um, is to respond uh, in, a, in a way that um, will, will actually effectuate a greater response um, to bad behavior, will get people the kinds of services they need, um, you know, who, who are presenting in, in, in ways um, uh, that, that show that they, they need help um, and they need services, uh, and frankly, to free up uh, police to do what police do the best, um, which is enforce the more serious matters and have you know, squadrons of people who can deal with the livability issues and the and the and the behavior issues that are of a lower grade, um, and and uh, and the idea behind um, the uh, um, get all my expressions, uh, kind of the this the um, additional intensive effort for a limited period of time is to see if we can't do a, a, a reset uh, and and uh, and really try to change the culture and change the climate, change the expectations and change the experience uh, for riders. Um, and you know, if it needs to keep going beyond the, the time limited uh, that we have expressed in the bill, then uh, here it is, the transit service intervention project. Um, uh, then then we'll, we'll do that. Um, we'll see if we can do that and extend that intensive focus effort to really get um, interventions of all types onto the train for some period of time get these stations cleaned up, uh, get the, the cars themselves cleaned up. All right, I spoke more than I intended to. I will pause now for um, questions, amendments, and conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Members, discussion, questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Dibble, uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I, I voiced the same concerns that I've heard from many of my people in my district that come up and travel for either a Vikings game or a Twins game, and, and they're uh, uh, you know afraid to ride uh, right now, and, and so something definitely needs to change. Um, Senator Coleman is not available today, but uh, I know she has an A6 amendment she'd like to offer, so I'd like to do that for her. The, I'd like to offer the A6 amendment. I think it's in your packet, but if not, if they could distribute it. And I'm, Madam Chair, I can describe it uh, while they're handing it out. Uh, basically, this just allows for two reports, uh, rider stats on ridership and then also on crime statistics that the, these be published. Uh, so with that, I uh, hope Senator Dibble would take this as a friendly amendment and uh, hopefully we can learn from the statistics of what's going on there that might help us in the future with uh, how we can address certain issues. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, Senator Coleman and I have spoken about this and this is um, similar, if not identical, to uh, a bill that she's introduced and I would accept this amendment as a, a very good idea and a friendly amendment. Very good, members. All in favor of the A6, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator uh, Jasinski. Thank you again, <laughs> Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Uh, another one that I've been looking at, and, and it, it, I'd like to offer the A7 amendment. They could disperse that, and again, I would explain that while they're dispersing that. Uh, basically, in Section 11, this adds uh, to the participating organizations. Uh, we would be adding troopers and adding Metro Transit as part of the group that uh, is part of the organizations of, of the bill. So again, I think a fairly friendly amendment. I think it just adds a couple uh, good, good groups that will give good input uh, as far as what's going on and how we can help the issues that we're dealing with with the light rail. Senator Dibble, when you're ready. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's the first time seeing it, but uh, we have our ideas when we have our ideas and, and uh, take our information um, 
when it comes. It's the purpose of hearings, so I would, I would accept this as a friendly amendment. Senator Dibble urges a yes vote on the A7. Members, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The A7 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, other questions? Seeing none. Madam Chair, I do. I'm sorry. No, Senator Jasinski. I thought we'd have some more discussion, but uh, uh, again, I know uh, Senator Dibble and Senator Newman's done a lot of work on this bill uh, over the years, uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, we've had discussions in our caucus as well on this, some, some good things, some bad things. Um, a couple of uh, my concerns, uh, again, Mr. Rothstein, I think, brought up some excellent points. One of the testifiers, the same thing that I'm hearing uh, from people that uh, try and use the uh, light rail from my area. Um, they're concerned of their safety and, and basically don't ride it because they're afraid to ride it. So I, we definitely have to change something. I'm a little bit concerned uh, in the bill on the fiscal note. There's really no cost that, you know, other than the original $2 million. We don't know what each of those costs are going to be. I don't know if it's 20 million a year or 2 million or 200,000. I guess we don't have any idea unless we have someone uh, from fiscal. We can at least estimate what those numbers are in the in the blanks. And maybe I'll ask staff at this point if we have some of those estimated numbers. I know they're not hard, but if we at least have some numbers, I think there's been some work in the past on this bill, and we may have some fiscal notes from previous bills. Council, is there an opinion? <laughs> Madam Chair and Senator Jasinski, there is a fiscal note underway on this delete everything language. Um, I think it's close to completion. Um, obviously, as you note, there will be a lot of staffing costs, some other costs to fill in in those blanks, but we don't have details releasable as of yet, unless Met Council would like to comment on that. <laughs> Senator Jasinski, did you have more? Uh, I, I have a few more comments, yep. Madam Senator Chair. Jasinski. Unless Senator Dibble wants to respond to that one first. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Chizinski. Um, the intent for this bill um, is for it to take a little trip through judiciary and then come back here. So we'll have more information when it lands back here, and then we can uh, figure out how much it's going to cost and whether we can find the money. I'm sure we will, though. It's pretty important. So. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator. And again, a little confusing what we're kind of putting two bills together, and, and it came to us kind of at the, I don't say the last minute, it was posted, um, but it's a lot to absorb right away, so I have a little bit of concerns about that. So it's good to hear that it will come back to this committee. Uh, that's something, if, if it wasn't going to come back, I'd ask you to talk to uh, the Chair of Judiciary and at least offer some amendments if we have some corrections that we can fix by then. So uh, if we can do that, I'd at least ask for that. Um, you know, one of the things that I see in it, again, I'm, I'm trying to become more and more familiar with it, but some of the language that was not included uh, was, you know, that it, we didn't, in the previous draft, didn't reduce police officers or police officers, and I think with the combination of the two by eliminating one of the sections, it, it eliminates that. So basically you're allowing for the reduction of the police force on the transit. Is that correct with the, with the new combined two bills and in eliminating one of those sections? So in this version, uh, you, we are for allowing for the reduction of police officers on the transit. Is that correct? Senator Dibble. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Jasinski, um, no, I'm not. I'm not for that and I'm not advocating for that. It was a, a curious uh, a bit of language. Um, I'm actually for, for there to be more police. I mean, I, I, you know, and I, I think as, as uh, Mr. Shetnan expressed, um, you know, they're trying to hire more police and, and I'm hoping that this bill will support that through, you know, some of the appropriations that we make um, to, to, to ramp up and, and staff up and fill the empty existing complements that they, that they do have. Um, part, part, you know, the part of the, you know, you know, I would have to take a closer look at the language, but part of, you know, part of the issue is that, you know, they, their compliment, staffing complement has been um, so depressed. Um, you know, I don't want to get us in, into that dynamic. Um, uh, but no, I, you know, the, you know, this was language, you know, you know I, I don't know if it'd be problematic to, to bring it back, um, but it was, you know, language that I think Senator Newman had first promoted and proposed, uh, fearing that the emphasis would turn away from police and towards the mm -hmm. ambassadors. That is not my intent at all. Um, it's to have sufficient number of police also focused on what police do best, not caught up in some of the issues that 
other kinds of personnel can more effectively deal with and more appropriately deal with um, and, uh, and have the kinds of responses that are warranted for the circumstance. Sometimes that's a police response, you know, a police you know, dealing with problematic behavior and or, you know, making arrests and, and you know, pursuing criminal activity and the like. And then also in working very closely in tandem with um, the trip personnel. Follow-up, Senator Zizinski. And thank you for, the, for that discussion. That makes me feel better because, again, I think more police would be the better thing. I understand the administrative things that we can do to help and assist that. I I'm fully uh, agree with that. Um, the bill seems a little heavy to me on some of the social services issues versus the, the fair things and smoking and those types of things and, and other issues. Um, so I was a little surprised by that. Um, uh, but going back to the, the one issue there, and, and I can't find it right now, but and I don't know what the current law is, but as far as, it, did it change something on sleeping on, on transit? Can you talk the, the, the differences between what's allowed now and in this bill, how that would be enforced? I guess I'm not familiar with that, and I apologize. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Jasinski. So the idea there is, you know, um, uh, some of that remains to be seen because a lot of these elements of the Rider Code of Conduct um, are, are going to be worked out in conversation with, you know, a, a wider consultation and collaboration with a wide array of, of experts, professionals, and community members. Um, so, 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 you know, so we definitely don't want the circumstance, you know, we want people to get into housing and shelter and, you know, get into, into you know, more appropriate settings. And, and I, I will say that Metro Transit has done actually a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, there's still a, you know, a lot of homelessness where folks are finding shelter um, on transit, but that is not an appropriate or humane or dignified setting. Sometimes it's an act of desperation, um, but they've worked very, very closely with uh, county shelter services, state shelter services, nonprofits, et cetera, um, identified people who are using transit as that kind of very last emergency warm place to be uh, out of the elements. Um, uh, and so, you know, we want to identify um, those issues uh, and, and get the help and deploy the help where it's needed. Uh, we don't want, uh, you know, you know, someone like, you know, the average rider who's dozing off um, to be targeted uh, for unwarranted, unpleasant, undignified attention. So, I, you know, I think I was trying to split that hair that, you know, sometimes people do doze off on the, on the train, you know, sometimes it is the place where they need to just kind of be for a few hours or, you know, the better part of a day. That's not necessarily a terrible thing. So I'm just trying to find that distinction. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I, I've, I know a person who used to work for the Metro Transit Police, and they use their, you know, common sense and sincere, I'll, I'll try to do that. But in this bill, so it will allow for sleeping. And again, I know we're trying to not do this, but in the, in the bill as written now, uh, people will be able to allow to be sleeping on the, on the, Transit, correct? It's Senator Double. Um, in in ways that don't violate uh, the you know the code of conduct. So, and I think so. There's a lot of discussion yet to discern. You know, when is sleeping actually using the train as a, as a shelter, and you know, and that and and and, and that sort of thing. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Double. Members, other questions, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm not exactly sure I, uh, what my question would be, but I came into this uh, after coming from the Judiciary Committee, and I don't know if it was discussed before, but um, uh, the disincentives that we heard about here, the disincentives to ride, and even the ones that you mentioned for yourself and for Representative Hornstein, those have to be broad. There must be a lot of people that are feeling the same thing about not riding the uh, the light rail and taking lifts and taking other other transportation options and I can't help but think the capital cost is sunk most of the operational cost is sunk but what's happening now is we're not getting ridership because we have uh, neglected the in the incentives to ride our light rail and I'm wondering if there's been an effort to try to figure out 
what is that costing us? It's got to be costing us a tremendous amount of money. And if there's something that when we get these reports, uh, I'm hoping that we look at that, that we look at how much are we giving up because we have not taken care of this asset like we, like we really ought to. Um, and just my, my own background, uh, I've ridden uh, the like kinds of transportation all around the world. And you never get that feeling, I shouldn't say never, but rarely get that feeling that you're uh, in danger or some, some other issue is happening. And I can tell you that, uh, just by the way, with our last conversation, everyone in the Japanese train sleeps. They all get on the train and go to sleep. But so it's, uh, you know, that's just a habit. And I think that, uh, you know, we can deal with that. But we also need to make sure that the people that are, that have no destination are the ones that we take care of. And we, we look at their lack of destination as something that's more desperation than anything else. So I'm hoping we can get a complete rundown of what these disincentives are and how we can attack them. And if, you know, if that's part of the uh, reports of, of uh, criminality or anything else, that, that we pay attention to each of those. So I really appreciate you bringing this uh, bill up, Senator Dibble. This is something we do, really do need to work on. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Dibble, do you have a comment? Just very response? quickly, I found it in my notes here, um, to the uh, first point that Senator Carlson made, a 2021 study found that 72% of Metro Transit customers said that safety concerns have affected how and when they choose to ride buses or trains. 72%. Thank you, Senator. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to follow up, because Senator Carlson brought up, and I didn't mean the sleeping. I, I understand that. But it's, it's actually, you know, residing there or the homeless is, was the concern. Uh, so I definitely understand the, the sleeps. Um, and one thing I know, Senator Newman's bill before, and you worked with him on that, uh, and kind of the funding for this, and, and looking at your bill with, with kind of the, I believe, kind of more a heavier discussion of social service type issues on there. Uh, which, you know, again, I want to share it across the state as far as the, the, the transit, but it seems like a, if it's really heavy on social services, that would be more of the people in the seven county area. And your funding goes to the general fund for this. And I know the previous bill talked about doing it, this, the counties uh, sharing in this cost. And with the change and seeing much more social services issue types things being addressed by these uh, uh, group. Uh, I'm wondering if you'd be open to some discussion on the funding because again, I'm fine with, you know, because I, you know, we have, I have residents that come up and use it for a Twins game or if I can if I get that, they pay their fee. But with the, the change in this bill, it seems like an awfully heavy on social service and, and I really believe, and, and I'm not trying to be fair, I think this, the brunt of this cost should be brought on by the, the seven county area that actually does the, the majority of these type issues. So I just wonder if you're open for that and maybe by the next reading, I, I just think it would make it much better and actually could I'll set it up for some bipartisan support. I think what the bill is written, you may not get much of that, but I think if we could look at the, the funding sources on how this is and, and addressing the social services side of it, that if we look at the funding from the counties uh, versus the state, it'd be much more uh, appealing to my caucus, so. Okay. Senator Debo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. Yeah, I think uh, we just stuck general fund in there as a placeholder, but I'm absolutely, I noticed that myself uh, um, and uh, would be very open to sources that are uh, closer to the operating support that Metro Transit uses to, to run the system. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Dibble, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Members, okay, Senator Devold. Oh, sorry, Senator McEwen. <laughs> I'll, I'll be very brief. I just also wanted to thank you for leading on this and for bringing this bill. Um, I've uh, ridden the the light rail with my kids, with my partner, and um, during the pandemic, we did at times feel that we weren't safe. Um, and really that had more to do with the fact that it felt like a ghost town in terms of personnel. So there were people struggling, but there was like nobody there. And it felt just like there was a real devaluation of that as a community good for us all. So I'm really glad that people are looking at this. I think it comes down to resources in the end, just making sure that we have the staff there to be able to take care of, of the stations and the people. So thank you for the, your leadership on this, Senator Debel. Thank you. And I'll move the bill. 
Thank or you, Senator. Maybe it's yeah. unless Senator if Dibble wants like any final remarks. Oh. Okay, Senator I'll, McEwen. I'll, I'll accept. Well, uh, <laughs> be a team effort. If, so we'll have Senator McEwen. It needs to be moved as amended to judiciary. I'll make the motion. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion before us. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Excellent. Motion carries, and the bill is passed as a, or Senate file 1049 is passed as amended and we refer to ju the Committee on Judiciary. Congratulations, Senator Dibble. So I was just informed that Senator Marty has a, has a witness who needs to, or testifier needs to leave fairly soon. So I apologize to the AED folks. We can jump. Uh, Senator Marty, you're able to go quickly? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll go quickly. It's ironic as we talk about Metro Mobility, the trouble is he couldn't get an extension on his ride, so he All right. has to leave. We soon. understand, yes. Um, so Senator... Mr. Marty, Senate File 1933. And Mr. Chair, we start with it. We have a delete everything amendment for A1 amendment. All right. So and I believe this is the language the House is using in its bill, and I can explain that if we need to. So is that the A1? Yes. Senator Marty moves the A1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Marty. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Metro Mobility, as you know, is a, is essential for a lot of people in our community, and it's very difficult for people to um, very difficult for people to get access to rides, and the limited hours available make it very hard for um, them as well. And this would be proposing a pilot project for. Uh, other service provider that apparently does some fill-in for extra work during Metro Mobility hours, but we establish a pilot program for two years that would <coughs> provide for advanced scheduling of Metro Mobility service outside of hours of regular Metro Mobility use and um, would be available anytime from 6, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday and then 7 to 11 on Saturdays and Sundays 7 to 10 p.m. Um, for the exact, for the full metro area and so on. And then we'd have a report to the legislature on how the pilot goes. Um, and it would be, well, asking some reasonable questions about how we should move forward with this. Um, and it would be appropriating 1.9 million for each of two fiscal years for the pilot project. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mark Hughes, um, who is, who's the one who came up with the proposal for the idea for the bill. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Welcome, uh, Mr. Hughes. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Dibble, I'm Mark Hughes, and I'm not so much a familiar face in the Senate, but I've been hanging around the House a while <laughs> and known John Marty a number of years. He's gracious enough to hear this, and you're our alternate, uh, Chair Dibble. Hey, this was really uh, taken on by uh, Representative Kelly Muller, who is the rep up in our area, who's done a terrific job of she should be Minnesotan of the year, really. Uh, it's, it's a project whereby, I'll explain the new project first. We would have, uh, and I'll just use an example, uh, Transit uh, Taxi Plus or Airport Cab, which has license currently, or did have when it started, 25 licenses. How I know that it, John Cheat and I were in on it at one time. Uh, getting all that set up, kind of, and uh, so we would start to use that. And the idea is to make Metro Mobility Service more efficient, give them some competition, uh, let go of the curfews, uh, and and and, uh, and make the whole overall operation more efficient because these buses, as we have now, are they're not diesel and they're about. 12 miles a gallon at best, whereby you could use a minivan and probably get 23 miles a gallon. So right there, we're saving money. And, and I'm sure we'll have to promise the cab service that we would keep a driver busy. Now, where this, for example, where this comes into effect for me is I 
uh, work for someone who has three shifts. By having a 8.30 curfew, I guess I can't do that. And I've always been about earning and not entitlement, so there you are. And uh, also, with Metro Mobility, I've been uh, had an accident whereby I was thrown out of my wheelchair and we were rear-ended in another accident. There's been two ice this year that I haven't been hooked up in the harness. That's a state uh, law fine. And so uh, Rep. Mahler, I believe, has a, a really valid point on getting this started. Now, it was heard in the House, and it landed right where I didn't want it to, in the omnibus for Frank Hornstein. That's because uh, Rep. Seberg was uh, concerned about cost, which there are some costs to it, but there's cost to everything you do. At one time, I had wanted to get to uh, the chair of uh, transportation uh, and uh, have it sent back to the MTC, whereby it first started in 1976 for the efficiency that the city buses and these buses would be kept under one roof. Then the driver's paid, and it doesn't matter what kind of bus he drives. He's qualified for all for one and qualified for all. So I think in summation thereof, you have the gist of what we are uh, really trying to do. I am really disappointed in the Met Council's management. I'm going go on record to say I'm disappointed in Metro Bullies management. This program hasn't been administered well at all. We haven't received the service that we really think we need to have. Uh, we're on hold now for, I was on hold for an hour and 13 minutes on Sunday. So somebody's dropping the ball. And this is taxpayers' money that's pretty well invested, and we need to make it more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Are there any questions? Okay. Any questions for Mr. Hughes? All right. Uh, we have Trevor Turner from the Minnesota Council on Disability. Thank you, John. Thank you. Was it all right? Welcome, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. Um, my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. And the Minnesota Council on Disability would like to thank Senator Marty for carrying Senate File 1933, uh, which would establish a pilot program to enhance Metro Mobility services. Um, Minnesotans with disabilities rely on Metro Mobility to live, work, and play in the communities of their choice, which help fulfill obligations of the Supreme Court Olmstead decision. <laughs> Metro Mobility is a paratransit service offered by Metro Transit that helps Minnesotans with disabilities travel across the Twin Cities metro area. Paratransit provides rides to Minnesotans with disabilities who cannot otherwise utilize regular Metro Transit route due to their disability. Paratransit is a right for people with disabilities guaranteed under the American with Disabilities Act and must provide equal services as other transportation options, especially those that are inaccessible. Senate File 1933 gives Metro Mobility the opportunity to try an innovative approach to enhancing its services and availability. An innovative approach is needed because Metro Mobility faces many challenges in providing service to Minnesotans with disabilities. One challenge of Metro Mobility is the demand far ex out, uh, exceeds the number of drivers and vehicles available to provide paratransit services. This leads to long wait times and unpredictable service which has severe consequences, especially on those who need the service the most. Another challenge in Metro Mobility is hiring and retaining drivers for their accessible vehicles. This can be addressed by paying drivers the same as they would pay regular Metro Transit bus drivers. While Metro Transit bus drivers are required to hold a higher class driver's license than Metro Mobility driver, Metro Mobility drivers are required to have the training and soft skills to provide door-to-door -door services and work with people who have complex disabilities. This alone more than justifies pay parity with Metro Transit drivers. Competitive wages would attract more people to the profession and help retain Metro Mobility's workforce, thus allowing Metro Mobility to offer enhanced services for its riders. This cannot be done without adequate funding for Metro Mobility. Minnesota must provide this funding and support because without it, it leads to degradation of services and violates the Americans with Disabilities Act. Properly funding Metro Mobility is supporting the civil rights for Minnesotans with disabilities. Senate File 1933 is a great move forward in the right direction to improve and enhance the services offered by Metro Mobility. Public transit is a lifeline for people with disabilities, and paratransit services are even more critical. These services allow people with disabilities to be an integrated part of their communities, and without it, they face exclusion and isolation. 
Paratransit services are a right guaranteed under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's imperative that these are services be reliable, convenient, and available for people with disabilities. The Minnesota Council on Disability looks forward to the results of the pilot program outlined in Senate File 1933, and we urge members of the committee to support this bill and other bills that provide support metro mobility. Thank you, and I'm available for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Turner. Questions, members? All right, and I see we have Charles Carson here who's available for questions should there be a need. So welcome, Mr. Carson. Um, all right, so members, questions? All right, I see a question brewing over here. Senator Jasinski. Sorry for the confusion. So was, that, was the A1 offered? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes, it was offered and... Uh, Okay. And accepted. Uh, what I have is uh, I'd uh, like to offer the A2 amendment to the amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A2 amendment, which would amend the A1 amendment. And then I'll have Ms. Boyd go over to, if she could, and explain the change. Ms. Boyd. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, uh, under current law, the way Metro Mobility is funded is through a direct general fund appropriation and every biennial budget. In the last biennial budget, there was a change enacted to how this is funded. Uh, beginning in fiscal year 26, Metro Mobility will be funded through a forecast amount with the Commissioner of Management and Budget working with the Met Council to predict how much Metro Mobility will cost and include that amount in, uh, um, require a general fund obligation for that amount. So it's essentially an open appropriation for Metro Mobility starting in fiscal year 26. Um, since the pilot project, um, extends a bit, about six months, into fiscal year 26. What this amendment will do would limit uh, the pilot project, would prohibit the pilot project from using any of that open appropriation for regular metro mobility operations and would limit it to the appropriation in the bill. And thank you, Mr. Chair. With that, I hope the author would uh, yeah. consider that as a friendly amendment. Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I think I, mean, I, I want to make sure it's the money to do the pilot program, but this is the end. By the way, if you see the fiscal note, which has a lot of good information, but it's based on the old thing and was a lot higher amount. But this one with a 1.96 million per each for each of the fiscal years, um, assuming that's sufficient, I mean, I, I hear your point because if you're opening it to the next biennium, in effect, it's with an open appropriation. So it, it seems like a reasonable amendment to me. Yeah, I think, uh, Ms. Boyd, if I could confirm, it, it would make sense because it would just guarantee that um, this pilot wouldn't cut into the existing service that Metro, Metro Mo provides. Mr. Through Chair, its regular appropriation. Yes, Mr. Chair, that's correct. This would just limit uh, the pilot project to only spend the money appropriated in the bill. Thank you. All right, so Senator Marty um, recommends a yes vote to the Jasinski A2 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Anything further, members? Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 1933? All right. Um, so uh, our intent, Senator Marty, is to lay this over for possible inclusion. We will do that at this time. Thank and you thank so you, much Mr. Chair and members, and thanks for the skipping ahead for the sake All of right. Metro. Yes, our, our folks uh, with the automated external defibrillators have been extremely patient. I apologize. I didn't expect my bill to go quite as long as it did. Um, so now, Senator Seberger, we will call you forward. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Senator Kieberger, welcome to transportation. Senate file 2648, please proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, here before you on Senate file 2648, which is a bill to provide uh, funding for automatic defibrillators, AEDs, in public spaces. Um, this bill would would provide grant funding of uh, $23,796,000 to the nonprofit Advocates for Health to help purchase and install AEDs on public land. Locations for these AEDs include state parks, public boat landings, rest stops, and outdoor school property. Advocates of, for Health have already installed over 100 outdoor AED monitored cabinets since 2019 and has already seen a positive impact in those communities. 
AEDs can save critical time for someone who has sudden cardiac arrest as chances of surviving sudden cardiac arrest decrease by 10% every minute that passes without treatment. In outdoor settings such as on the lake or in a park, it may be more difficult for first responders to get there in time and these AEDs can greatly increase the chance of, that someone lives. Anyone can suffer from sudden cardiac arrest, old and young, rich and poor, these AEDs will benefit all Minnesotans across the state as every county will see these AEDs in their community. Uh, members in your packets, you will find a document, uh, Advocates for Health Life Saving Solutions on page 13, which shows the various locations where an AED would be utilized. Um, on a personal level, uh, many of you know, maybe some of you don't, I'm a paramedic. And we are highly trained in uh, performing CPR and the importance of applying electricity early in the process if it's a shockable rhythm. Um, these things save lives. We see them everywhere and that's a good thing. I just popped out to go to the restroom and in the hall, right down the hall, well, there's one on the wall. Um, I think having them outside in places where uh, it's frankly can be hard to get to and can be a time delay if someone calls 911 and the ambulance has to go down a trail and uh, the, the paramedics have to jump out and go through the woods and, and get to the to the boat landing. Um, this is a great idea. We have a couple of testifiers here who can speak specifically to the, um, the setup as we see it here and how it would work out uh, out in the wild. We have Joel. All right, so we yeah. have Joel Vogel and Caitlin Gilk. <clears throat> so welcome to the committee. Whoever would like to start can do so. Just please introduce yourself and then Good afternoon, proceed. Chair Thank Dibble you. and committee members. My name is Joel Vogel with Advocates for Health. I appreciate uh, Senator Seberger uh, taking this and bringing it forward. Um, the one thing that most people don't understand is that you only have a 5% chance of making it if you go out with sudden cardiac arrest. Unless you get that AED on you in that period of time, you're, then your chances of survival go all the way up to 75 to 80%. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on the reasons for uh, an AED. Caitlin's going to spend a little bit of time going with the uh, myths and, and facts about that. I want to spend a little bit more time letting you understand the three objections we always get. One, they're going to freeze if they're outside. Two, somebody's going to steal them. And three, some young kid's going to put it on some other young kid and shock him and kill him. Okay? Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a demonstration briefly uh, with the outdoor cabinet so you understand what it is. Is it okay if I move over there? Of course. Thank you. So the cardiac restart AD is made out of stainless steel in Holding Ford, Minnesota. What we do is you take this and we put on the red cabinet, which comes from Paris, France. When someone is in need of an AED, they just come up. First of all, you want to call 911. You just grab it and open it. I have taken off the siren today so it doesn't make all kinds of noise, and it'll go on really loud. There is a camera here that will then take 12 photos of whoever opened the cabinet. They might be just snoopers, so then they close it back up, no problem. If in fact they needed the AED, they would grab the AED, and as they did that, along with it will come the bag for a scissors inside to cut clothing if need be, a mask, and everything else. At that time, the camera then takes another 12 pictures of the person who took it. There's an Apple AirTag attached to this so we know where it's going or where it ends up. Okay. There is a heater right here in the back. So when it was 30 degrees below back in January, we had zero problems with these going below 35 degrees. There is a built-in cell phone in here that is communicating um, daily with us, hourly, whenever needed, so we know what's happened. It automatically sends a text message and says the cabinet's been open since the photos. We know exactly what, what can be done, uh, what we need to do, or who has that. So then they take the AED and they take it to the person in need. We've selected the, by the way, any AED will work in here. It does not have to be this particular manufacturer. 
We selected this manufacturer because there's a whole bunch of different people who may open this. If in fact you take this and all you have to do is press start, this is a demo. Training is that there's an AED nearby, and everybody knows where it is. Well, there are AEDs be around, but they're locked up. Is this building ever locked up? Okay. Can't get at it. I came in and I talked to Dennis downstairs, and he was very, very nice to meet the guard that, that meets people to come to testify, great guy. And we got to talking, and I said, you got an AED here? He said, yeah, right there across, right behind the county. He was very proud, he showed me it. I says, so uh, what happens if you go down, Dennis? And he says, I don't think anybody knows that it's here. So I'm going to ask you, how many people in this room know how to do CPR? We got a few. How many people know where the closest AED is to their home? Okay. So we got a few people, people that know that. As long as you can get to them, and you can get to them at Sunday Receiver Reset in the first 10 minutes, your chance of survival is good. After that, the heart's not going to have a rhythm, and it's not going to advise you to shock the victim at that time. You're just going to have to continue CPR and hope that you can put a lupus uh, device on a lupus device on it and do it that way and be able to have them come back. Um, I'd entertain any questions about the unit right now, if anybody had any at this point. If you could return to the microphone. All right, questions, members? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, does it need to be near power plugged in, uh, hardwired? What's the... How is, how Mr. Vogel. Uh, th thank you. That's a great question. The answer is yes. It runs off of a 110 
uh, voltage, and then that AED, your cardiac restart up on top there, actually uh, lights up at night so it's very visible. And by the way, we can we can put anything you want up there. It doesn't have to say cardiac reat. It could be the state of Minnesota life-saving AED uh, unit up there if that, if that wanted to be there. Right. Other questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I actually, I have a lake property, and we have four of them on the lake, and we have, you know, uh, each of our associations, or there's one each one, and we have to replace the batteries every so often, but they're accessible, so it's great. Um, and I appreciate the goal of the bill, um, but I think targets are coming up pretty soon, so I have a couple questions. So uh, looking at the bill, it looks like it gives 3% of the money to 80s to transportation jurisdiction, 48% to the DNR, and 49% to MDE. So I'm just making sure this isn't coming out of our target. Uh, for transportation uh, so we can keep that money for roads and bridges. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Senator Jasinski, um, uh, remains to be seen. Um, uh, this would be, of course, from the general fund. It won't be trunk highway funds. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I can't say for sure exactly um, whose target it'll come out of, but uh, okay. working on it. Okay, I would just hope we uh, not take it out of transportation or only 3% of, of the total funding from our transportation target because we want to save that money for roads and bridges and, and things we can do on transportation related. So, uh, And then also just one other uh, amendment I'd like to offer, the A1. Uh, what this does is just give another a report and then adds a few more things in the reporting requirements uh, for the program. And we can report out the amendment if you'd like. So Senator Jasinski offers the A1 amendment. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Senator Dzinski to the A one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Sieberg. I just uh, hope you consider this as a friendly amendment and. Uh, get some more information on the, how good it's working. And uh, with that, I'd ask for a, a red vote, or a green vote, sorry, or yes vote. Uh, Senator Seberger uh, to the A1. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski. Um, I've had a, uh, just a few minutes to look this over, confer uh, with the stakeholders here. We do consider this a friendly amendment, so I have no problem accepting this. All right, Senator Seberger recommends a yes vote. All in favor of the A1, say aye. Aye, opposed say no. Motion carries. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, we have someone else to testify. So why don't we jump to that? I apologize for jumping to uh, committee, committee work. Uh, Ms. Gilk. Thank you. So my name is Caitlin Gilk. A little backstory of why I'm here. When I was 16, I did my Girl Scout Gold Award, and this was my project. I raised over $22,000 to put outdoor AEDs in my hometown of Painesville, Minnesota, and we, before I did my project, had no AEDs that were available within that 10-minute time frame, 24-7. So we had some AEDs around town, but they weren't very accessible, and they were only open a few days a week, a few hours. So I really took it upon myself to do this as my Gold Award project. And the outpouring of funds and money and support for this project in just my small town of Painesville was huge. And then I started working for Advocates for Health. I've now worked for Advocates for Health for two years with the nonprofit. And since then, I've been exposed to so many different stories, testimonies, all sorts of things. People young, old, of all ages who have experienced sudden cardiac arrest, who have lost children to sudden cardiac arrest, all sorts of people and all sorts of stories that affect everybody. Even myself, I've been at football games and classmates of mine have gone down and AEDs weren't available. One of the places, we actually had an outdoor cabinet place and the AED was accessible within two minutes for him. So. My testimony is that I think these are a great thing to put in public places around Minnesota. Having them outdoors and accessible for all ages is really important. Athletic fields, uh, at the schools, the wayside rests, the parks, you never know if it's gonna be your child who experiences this, you who experiences this, your spouse, anyone. You really want that AED to be there and accessible within those couple minutes. Thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. That's fantastic work. I appreciate the story. $22,000. That's, that's amazing. 
Um, members, anything further? Senator Morrison. I'll be brief because I know we have to go, Mr. Chair. Uh, but I just wanted to thank Senator Seeberger for using her expertise to bring forward this really important issue. Thank you for the presentation. I loved how you um, reiterated how easy it is to use an AED. It's so important because I think some people are intimidated by them. And thank you too, Ms. Gilk, for your incredible work and the good that you've done for your community. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you for this. Thank you, Senator Morrison. All right, members, uh, anything further? Oh, Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I have a question of the team up here that um, I like the idea that they're more accessible. I don't like the idea that I don't know where the nearest one is to my home. Uh, I don't like the idea that they get closed up in these uh, locked buildings at night. What's your uh, ideas of maybe taking some of these that are not uh, publicly accessible and getting them out into the open? We, we do an awful lot of that where Mr. That, that's advantage here is you can use any AED that is the, the currently out there. Uh, we just switch, switch that out and things. So we have had situations in uh, Pearl Lake, Minnesota, where the, Ca the Catholic Church there took it from inside the church because the church was locked up and only open on Saturday nights and Sunday for a period of time, and they put it on the outside of the, the building there. We would encourage that. What you want to do is you want to look at the communities that everybody knows where, where it is. And that's why we said everybody knows where the wayside rest is. Everybody knows where the school is, the high school, if it's outside by the football field or by, by things. There's, state law requires them to have them there, but we find that it's not being done uh, there. Sometimes there's two sports going on, which field is it at or whatever. So we, we definitely would work with that. Senator Carlson. Yes, a follow up. Uh, Senator Dibble, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I Googled AED locations on my phone, and it's giving me some kind of mixed reviews on it. Uh, if I needed to, I could uh, Google uh, charging stations for electric cars and get the exact locations of them uh, everywhere around here and just driving down the road. But uh, I think it would be great if we could get these AEDs uh, into some kind of an app that we can Yeah, so I can find. say something about that. So a part Please of go. our nonprofit is the education and awareness of AEDs, and we actually work with two different registries. So the National AED Registry, we register all of our AEDs um, with that system. And then also there is an app called Pulse Point, and we put all of our outdoor AED locations on there. So actually, Joel before this looked up where the nearest AED is to us, and the only one that was registered was in the building across the street. So even though there's AEDs in this building, the only one in this area that showed up was the one across the street. And Mr. Chair, thank you. More power to you on that. All right. Members, anything further? So Senator Morrison, would you like to move, move this bill to uh, environment? So moved, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So Senator Morrison moves... Senate file 2648, as amended, be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Environment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator Seberger. Thank you very much. Thanks. Senator Zinsky, bring us home. We're going to go fast. Okay. Senator Zinsky, Senate file 1579. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. I uh, saved the best bill for the last. It's uh, the most controversial. No, I'm just kidding. It's a very simple bill. Uh, it's a technology bill. Uh, with that, in a matter of time, I'm just going to turn it right over to my testifier. Um, go ahead. Mr. Hill. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the record, my name is Todd Hill with Hill Capital Strategies, and I just wanted to clarify on the agenda, I was listed as being here on behalf of the deputy registers, but today I'm here on behalf of Copart. Um, Copart is a national vehicle auction service company with three locations in Minnesota, uh, in St. Cloud, Ham Lake, and Minneapolis. All this bill quickly allows us to do is, in the case of a car being totaled, that the insured would be able to uh, electronically sign their title over to the insurance company. It is, uh, there is no opposition. The Insurance Federation supports this. DVS is fine with it. And it's just simply uh, an effort to, uh, to expedite the process of uh, processing titles for total claimed vehicles. Thank you. Questions, members? 
All right. Senator Drazinski, I believe this can go to the floor if you'd like to make that motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I recommend Senate File 1579 be approved and sent to general orders. All right. All in favor of Senator Drazinski's motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chair. So members, uh, pretty sure we're meeting on Friday. Haven't rolled out the bills yet. We'll do that tonight. Um, so uh, that, I guess taking Monday off was not such a great idea, but I'm glad we did it. So, all right, with that, we are adjourned.